And the title of our sermon this morning is The Command to Believe. The Command to Believe. And we're in John chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. And we've been working through John 14. And now, as we've come to this section in the Gospel of John, the primary concern in John 14 of the Lord Jesus Christ is the faith of his disciples. The primary concern of the Lord Jesus Christ as we come to John 14 is the faith of his disciples. Now, as the disciples are gathered together with the Lord in the upper room, they are facing tremendous difficulty, tremendous adversity. They have, by faith, left all to follow Christ. They've given up everything to follow him. And they've been sent now to the front lines of a raging battle. Now, by virtue of their union with Christ, by grace through faith, the disciples in John 14 and all disciples after them will suffer trials, will suffer persecution, will suffer difficulty. Paul said, in the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. As we consider this text this morning, let's remind ourselves of what they're facing and why the Lord's charge to believe is so critical and pressing. We need to remember the context of what we're studying here, okay? First, Judas, one of their inner circle, has departed into the night to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. The betrayal of Judas Iscariot sets events in motion that will inexorably lead to the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to die. He tells them, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and they will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. In Luke chapter 22, the Lord tells Peter that Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. In Matthew chapter 26, the Lord tells them that all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And then looking into the future, beyond the cross, the Lord warns them, they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. These men, these disciples, and all disciples after them are going to face fierce, ongoing, intensifying trials. And for these disciples, they will be trials that will eventually lead to their own deaths. And now the Lord prays in Luke 22. He says, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. The Lord knows they're going to need faith. They're going to need faith to get through the difficulty. The Lord knows that faith is going to have to endure assault. The Lord knows that faith is going to have to weather raging storms, persevering one vicious attack after another. As we consider these things, think about it with me. What are we doing? We're giving context to the Lord's instruction in John chapter 14. That context is important, and it's gracious provision from God to us for us to understand these things. Let me tell you why, all right? As we consider what these men faced, and as we consider how they persevered, as we consider the testimony of their lives to the grace of God in Christ, we're to remember that these men are men with a nature like ours, we are to be spurred on by their example. We're to learn from their example. Now, their example is not a perfect example. And I'm grateful for that, right? We see their warts. If they were a perfect example, then their perfect example might not be an encouragement to imperfect people like us, right? But the fact that their example is an imperfect example is an encouragement to us. They are men with a nature like ours. If you know your Bible, you remember James speaking about that in James chapter 5 of Elijah. Elijah, James says, was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed, he exercised faith that it wouldn't rain. And they had a drought for three years and six months. So considering context then, I want to set the stage for what we're talking about in John 14, Considering context, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. 
Hebrews chapter 11. We need to understand the faith that the Lord Jesus Christ is explaining in, Hebrews, uh, in John chapter 14. We're going to get some information about that in Hebrews 11. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about examples of faith. Well, let's go to the great hall of faith in Hebrews 11. Now, bear with me as we go through this. I want to develop a point that's going to be important for us to understand back in John 14, okay? Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Look beginning with me at verse 1. Here, the Bible reads, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word for substance there is hypostasis. Hypostasis. That word refers to the the underlying reality behind things that we see, the underlying reality behind what has appeared to us, the appearance of things. It's an underlying reality behind something. In other words, it's not ethereal, right? It's not nebulous. It's not subjective or undefinable. It's objective and it's real. Faith stands behind what we're going to see here. It is the substance, the reality, the substance of things hoped for. You fight, right? You yell. Someone cuts you off in traffic. You lose your temper. What is the hypostasis? What's the reality or the substance behind what you just did? It's anger, right? Anger is the reality behind your reaction in traffic when somebody cuts you off. Anger is the hypostasis. Now, in Christ... We have a great hope. We have a great hope. We hope to be with him. We hope to be in heaven. We hope to be free from sin one day. What's the substance? What's the reality behind those things that we hope for in Christ? What's the reality? It's faith. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. But he goes on now. Think with me. How does James say that we show or demonstrate that faith by works. James says that we demonstrate or we show our faith by our works. Faith then must be the hypostasis, must be the substance, must be the reality behind the works that we do, okay? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Look back at verse one. Our faith then with all its accompanying works, with all its accompanying fruits, then is the elenkos, the evidence or the proof or the demonstration of things not seen. Now, what are those things that are not seen? One, God is not seen. God is invisible, immortal, right? God is invisible, not seen. The Bible says, doesn't it, that Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, what? You love. You love. The Lord Jesus Christ, you've not seen. You've not heard his voice with your ears. You've not seen him with your eyes, yet you love him. Heaven is invisible. We don't see heaven. But the proof or the demonstration or the evidence of those things is what? Faith. Faith. An active, thriving, working, obedient, living faith. All that is a proof, is an evidence, a demonstration of those things which we don't see. Our faith is the reality behind our hope. Our faith is the proof of things unseen. Now listen, look at verse two. By that faith, the elders obtained a good testimony. And what that means is they gained approval. And here, gained approval specifically from God. I want you to see that. Drop down to verse four. How did they obtain a good testimony? In what way did they obtain a good testimony? Look at the example of Abel in verse four. By faith, right? By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It doesn't say that by faith, Abel offered his faith. By faith, Abel, in an expression of his faith, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness. Witness from whom? From, witness from God right? Witness from God. He obtained witness that he was righteous. God himself testifying of his gifts and through it, he being dead still speaks. Now, what was the underlying reality, the hypostasis behind Abel's sacrifice? Faith. Faith. True, authentic, 
practiced, exercised, obedient, living, thriving faith. Through, I want you to get the point, okay? Follow along with me. Through his visible act of offering his sacrifice, it was witnessed, it was observed by God who gave testimony to it that Abel was righteous. Do you see? Now, God knows the heart. The Bible says that God doesn't look on the appearance, the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, right? But God looks at the evidential work of, of Abel by faith to confirm, to affirm, and to give testimony that Abel had righteous, saving, genuine, authentic, living, thriving, true faith. James says, doesn't he? I'll show you my faith by what? By my works, by my works. What does, incidentally, what does James call the so-called faith that is not demonstrated by works? He calls it dead, that's right, dead James calls it dead, unsaving, fake, counterfeit, you're on your way to hell kind of faith, right? It's a faith that's not accompanied by works. And by the way, another incidental here, uh, if you're going to a biblical church, you're going to be in the Bible, right? We, we spent our preparation for worship in Exodus. We're preaching through the gospel of John. We're in Hebrews talking about James, right? That's what a biblical church does. We're in the Bible. And if you're a Christian, you love the Bible. Verse five, look at verse five. By faith, Enoch, when he was taken away, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now think about that statement for a moment, right? Enoch didn't say, I believe, right? And click his heels three times. There's no place like heaven. There's no place like heaven. There's no place like heaven. And then just mystically disappear into heaven. That's not the way it worked. Before he was taken, before God took him, he had this testimony. He pleased God. Now, what do we do to please God? How do you please God? That's right. You obey you keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are our delight. How many of his commandments do you keep? All of them. All of them, right? Yeah, I'm keeping this one over here, so it's just not as important for me to keep all those over there, right? When the Bible tells you to obey in faith out of a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you do? You obey. But listen, I'm a sinner. I'm just trying as hard as I can No, if the Bible tells you to obey, you obey and you obey in faith. And that obedience is your delight. You delight to please God. That was Enoch's life. Enoch had this testimony before God that he pleased God. Look at verse six. Now, without, you could say, this kind of faith, without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, let that sink in for a moment. Without this kind of evidence-producing, fruit-producing, obedient, healthy, thriving, living your life kind of faith, it is impossible to please him. I was talking to somebody the other day, witnessing to him, and he says, I believe God. I believe God. Had absolutely no impact whatsoever in his life, but I believe God. I love God. I even go to church every now and then. Listen, without this kind of faith, the faith of Enoch, the faith of Abram, uh, Abel, the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, without that kind of faith, you have a dead faith. It is impossible to please him. Listen, verse six. Without this kind of faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who what? diligently seek him, diligently seek him. Now look at these examples. Lord gives us great examples here in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse seven. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not seen, what did Noah do? He moved with godly fear. What did Noah do that evidenced his faith? He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ through the means of faith in Christ, by the grace of God. 
He prepared an ark. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham acted in faith and he obeyed God. Without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please him. Drop down to verse 17. Verse 17 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. Now, if you remember that story, he trusted God. By faith, he took his only son, the son of promise. He took him by the hand, led him to the top of Mount Moriah. He had the dagger in his hand and he had the dagger raised to obey God in faith. And he was gonna take the life of his son and sacrifice him as the Lord had commanded. And he did this by faith. He says he was, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now that's important to think through. Abraham received the promises from God. God made a covenant with Abraham and Abraham believed the promises. And Abraham's belief in the promises, his belief in God, his trust that God would keep his word was the motivation for Abraham to obey God and to follow God in obedience with his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Verse 18 of whom it was said, and Isaac, your seed shall be called. Abraham, verse 19, concluded that God was able to raise him up. I think about the faith of Abraham, right, in that moment. God's able to bring him back to life. God's able to raise him up. Even from the dead, verse 19 says, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. The Greek word for faith comes in a noun form and in a verb form. I want this to make sense for you, all right? The noun form, a noun is a person, place, or thing, all right? Faith, the Greek word for faith comes in a noun form and it comes in a verb form. A verb is an action word. You're gonna take action, a verb, okay? The noun form of the word is often translated faith. It's translated faith. It's a, it's a noun, it's a thing, it's faith, okay? In English, in English, there's no verb for faith. I'm gonna faith you. Or I'm going to go faithing. There's no, there's no verb for faith in English. And so often the verb form of the Greek word for faith is translated as believe. I'm going to believe. Or it's translated trust. Or it's translated exercising faith. Okay? That's the way the Greek verb is often translated. Now what we see, what we see in Hebrews chapter 11, this is important for us to understand, we see in Hebrews 11 examples of people who are verbing their noun, okay? Let, this, let that sink in. If you're not verbing, you don't have the noun. Hebrews 11, full of examples of godly men, godly women who are verbing their noun. If you don't verb the noun, you don't have the noun. Verbing the noun goes with the noun. Okay, they are showing their noun by their verb. Okay, they're demonstrating their faith by their faithfulness, their faith acting, exercising, working in faith, obeying. Drop down to verse 24. Drop down to verse 24. By faith, what James might say to Moses, Moses, show me your faith. And Moses is like, how do I show you my faith? He's going to have to work. He's going to have to demonstrate his faith. So, so what does Moses do in verse 24? By faith, as an evidence of faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now, Moses had it pretty good, didn't he, in Pharaoh's household? Had it pretty good, pretty comfortable life. Moses chose he sought out, he decided to suffer affliction, difficult, terrible, hard affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That's an evidence of Moses' faith, and that's why Moses is in the hall of faith. Look at verse 26. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater 
riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. He had faith. He looked to the reward. Verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Why am I laboring on this point? Why am I laboring on this point? Because most churches do not teach this. And most professing Christians, and I intentionally say professing Christians. Why? Because many of them are not Christians, all right? Most professing Christians don't believe this. They don't live like this. They don't make these decisions. They don't have this kind of faith. Most churches don't teach it. Most professing Christians don't believe it. Most professing Christians think of faith as little more than belief in or agreement with or acknowledgement of a list of biblical facts. That's what faith is to them. It's just agreement with or belief in a set of facts. Yes, most pastors today, yes, most pastors about faith, you've witnessed to them, I've witnessed to them, I've talked to them, they'll say, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe this about Jesus or that about Jesus? Do you believe that you're a sinner? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sin? Well, then you're saved. And where is Jesus right now? Well, he's in your heart. And don't doubt it. If you doubt it, that's Satan making you doubt that's not the biblical gospel. That's not what the Bible teaches. And yet it is a rampant error in churches today. It is everywhere. You've seen it. I've seen it. They've turned biblical faith. They've turned biblical faith into nothing more than mental assent, intellectual assent. They've sucked the heart out of the biblical gospel. They've sucked the heart out of genuine saving faith and it's nothing more than just Disney pixie dust princess belief in something. There's no trust. There's no commitment. If you think about the world in which we live, right? Everyone, everyone, everyone is walking around with terminal cancer. And they are going to die. The medicine that is being doled out by most churches, the medicine that they are only too willing to suck down their throat themselves, is the medicine that doesn't heal the cancer. It only numbs them. It just numbs them. You talk to them, you try to witness to them, you try to share the truth of God's word with them, and it's like, listen, I'm fine, I'm good, I believe in Jesus. The real medicine, the real cure, is often painful, isn't it? There are times it's gonna make you throw up, <laughs> it's gonna be difficult, it's not gonna feel good, it's sometimes painful, it's often uncomfortable, but listen, it's real. It is the saving balm of the gospel. Moses chose, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy that numbing, fake, counterfeit, false, snake oil kind of faith. And he did that as a fruit, as an evidence, as a demonstration of his faith. Like Moses, like Moses, you and I must choose that kind of faith. Like Moses, we have to choose that belief. We have to demonstrate our faith. By, it's not a let go and let God, right? 
I believe in Jesus, and so whatever happens, God's gonna do. You know, besides, I'm a sinner. Listen, I don't have any control. I remember witnessing to a guy in his driveway. He was about to divorce his, to divorce his wife. He had been committing adultery, and his excuse was, well, I can't do anything about it. Well, yes, you can. Stop committing adultery, repent of your sin, and don't divorce your wife. Evidence your faith by your obedience to God. If it's a genuine, thriving, healthy, living faith, it's going to produce these fruits. Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The brothers are out preaching Christ in the parks. Brothers are out laboring at the abortion mills, going door to door, preaching the gospel at work, preaching the gospel at, at school, and where are you? Where are you? Maybe you're suffering affliction with a demanding boss at work. How are you going to respond? How do you work? How do you labor in that circumstance? What do you do? Maybe you're suffering affliction at school, around your friends. Maybe you're suffering affliction in your marriage. How are you to respond? Choose to suffer affliction as a Christian rather than sin to get your way out of it. Choose with Moses to exercise this kind of faith. Everything else is a, a wicked counterfeit. Everything else is a numbing fake. Look, drop down to verse 35. Others were tortured. Listen to this. Not accepting deliverance. Remember hearing the story about John Bunyan in prison. His little girl sick. She was going to die. It was said of John Bunyan that all he had to do was get out of prison was to renounce his faith. To renounce his faith. It would have let John Bunyan go. He could have spent the last years of his life with his daughter. But he chose... To stand for the faith, if it meant prison to him, and his daughter died, choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than compromise the gospel, rather than compromise his convictions, take the easy way out, cheat, so that he can indulge himself. These others, verse 35, were tortured, not accepting deliverance so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had a trial, had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. Now listen, they chose this. It wasn't, it was, we've got to get out of this mindset that these things always and only passively happen to us. They chose that. Think about the brothers and sisters who go down to the abortion mill. If you're out there, you're suffering affliction. That's, there's just no way around that. They chose to do that. Can't always think about faith as something that passively happens to us. God's people choose with Moses to suffer affliction with the people of God. They choose to go into the fray. They choose to fight the fight, right? They battle sin. They battle enemies from within and enemies from without. And they choose that life. I'm going to wage war against my sin. Because I would rather suffer affliction for Christ than die in my sin and go to hell. I'm going to choose to get out there with the people of God and serve Christ. Because I'd rather do that than take the, ease, the, the flowery beds of ease, right? The broad road that leads to destruction. These men, those who wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth, these were men with a nature like ours. <laughs> men with a nature like ours. If you're a genuine Christian, then examples like this should convict you and spur you on, right? Spur you on to greater obedience, greater faithfulness to Christ. 
Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, this is his charge to us in light of these truths. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, right? All our brothers and sisters over the centuries who have lived and died for Christ. Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight Lay aside that apathy, lay aside that indifference, lay aside that laziness, lay aside that passing pleasure, lay aside that sin, lay aside that compromise, right? Lay aside all that weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, it's interesting in considering the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Lord Jesus Christ exercised faith in going to the cross. He trusted the Father in going to the cross. God the Father is gonna raise him up. Back in John 14, that's the introduction. (laughs) Back in John 14, I want to give you context. I want to set the stage. If you think about the disciples in John 14, and then you think about the Lord's concern for their faith in him, it's important to understand that context. They are facing tremendous difficulty, all right? And in facing that tremendous difficulty that will last from now until the rest of their lives, the rest of their lives, right? The disciples were all killed for their faith. They went to their deaths preaching Christ. John boiled in oil, right, and then exiled on Patmos before he died. The rest of the disciples all martyred for their faith. Considering what they're about to face, the primary concern of the Lord Jesus Christ in John 14 is their faith in him, the quality of that faith, the maturity of that faith, the nature of that faith. The Lord knows what the hypostasis is behind endurance. The Lord knows what the reality is, the substance is behind faithful perseverance. The Lord knows what the substance is, the reality is behind faithful obedience, behind the preaching of the gospel, behind their facing a hostile world. The reality behind that which we see as the persevering of these disciples is faith, a healthy, thriving, living faith in Christ. Now, the Lord knows that his disciples need a well-informed noun. They need a well-informed noun, an informed, mature faith, the content of their faith, who he is, what he's done, what they've been delivered to. They need a well-informed noun and... Once they have the well-informed noun, he knows that they must verb that noun. They must commit. They must obey. They must endure. They must trust. They must follow. So look at with me at, at John chapter 14 and look at verse 1. John 14 verse 1. Three sharp staccato commands from the Lord in verse 1. Three imperatives. Here they are. Don't be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, we talked about that last week. Those are three imperatives in the scripture. Doesn't necessarily read that way in some of your English translations. It's not, you believe in God? Well, then believe also in me. That's not the way that this is to be viewed. These are three imperatives. Don't be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. Three commands. Now, look down, drop down. The the commands in verse 1 are followed by another urgent command in verse 11. Look at verse 11. The Lord says, believe me. Believe me that I'm in the Father, or else believe me for the sake of the works, but believe me. Now those commands are then interspersed as we've been working through the text, right? They're interspersed with trust in Christ, hope in Christ, following Christ, knowing Christ, praying to Christ. But those commands indicate what the the Lord's major concern is for them in John 14, their faith. Not just faith to get through a tough time, not just faith for that individual circumstance. This is the kind of faith they're going to need to make it to heaven. 
This is saving genuine faith. And the Lord is concerned with your faith this morning also. He's concerned with the kind of faith that you have, that you're exercising, the kind of faith that you possess, all right? Now first, on your notes, saving faith must be rightly rooted. It must be biblically grounded. You've got to have biblical content for your noun, all right? And saving faith is rooted and grounded in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see first on your notes the object of faith explained in verses 7 through 9, the object of faith. Look at verse 7 with me. If you had known me, the Lord says, then you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Now Philip said to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him in verse 9, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Our knowledge of God, right? If you think about the knowledge that you possess of God, our knowledge of God consists entirely in what God himself has revealed to us. God must reveal himself to us. Now, certainly, God has revealed himself to us in his word. We have an awesome, (laughs) irreplaceable, glorious revelation of who God is, what God has done, redemptive history. This book is sufficient for life and godliness. It gives us everything that we need, all right? Certainly, the Bible reveals God to us. But now think about it. God has revealed himself to us in creation. Psalm 19, 1, right? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. So that the heathen, Romans 1, are without excuse. They can look at creation and from creation, they know that there's a creator. God reveals himself to us in creation. If you think about it further, God has revealed himself to us in man. Man was made in the image of God. In the image of him, he made them, right? Genesis God has revealed himself in man. And man, with the law of God written on their hearts, man's conscience accuses him, right? Cries out to him that man is going to be accountable to his creator. Your conscience bears witness that there's a God. Now, in one sense, God also reveals himself in history. The Lord God omnipotent reigns. And he reigns over all the affairs of men. He reigns over history. He directs all things according to his will. He directs all things according to his eternal purpose. And even in history, we can see a revelation of God. But preeminently, preeminently, God has revealed himself in the person of his son. God became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And that's what John says in the prologue. For 33 years... He walked the dirt of our existence and displayed his glory among us, revealing God to man and leading man to God. Paul in Colossians 1 says that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God incarnate, is the image. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So if you think about the Lord Jesus Christ now, in his perfect life, we see God's holiness, don't we? In his teaching. We know God's wisdom in his selflessness, in his sacrifice. We see God's kindness. We see God's mercy. We see God's grace and so on. We see the invisible God in the incarnate view, perspective of his son. Now, it's this kind of revelation that the Lord is referring to in verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Verse seven is the subject of our revelation, the subject of revelation. Is God the father in the perfect person and work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? If you think about the grammar in verse seven, look at verse seven. Based on the grammar, don't read verse seven as a correction or as a rebuke. You can read it like this. Well, if you had known me, right, you would have known Don't read it like a correction or rebuke. This is an assurance on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that from the grammar. It better to be read like this. If you have come to know me, which they have, you will know my Father also. 
That's the sense behind the statement. If you've come to know me, then you'll know my Father also. In other words, the knowledge of Jesus Christ is knowledge of God the Father. Do you see? If you go on in verse 7 now, the from now on in verse 7 translates two Greek words. Two Greek words. Now, if you read the Greek, we know there are no spaces. There are no spaces between Greek words. So if you take those two Greek words and you put them together, no space between the two, the word is translated assuredly, assuredly. So the idea is this, the idea is this. If you have come to know me, then you will know my father also. Assuredly, you know him and have seen him. Now we can know from the disciples, the time that they have spent with the Lord Jesus Christ, that at one level, the disciples know the Lord Jesus Christ. They followed him around. For three years in ministry. And in the Son, in the Lord Jesus Christ, they both know the Father and have seen the Father. But they don't quite fully understand that yet. This is still difficult for them. They've not fully grasped the incarnation. All that's going to come after the cross, that's going to come when the Spirit comes. They're going to more clearly understand these things. It won't be until after the resurrection that they begin to make those connections, right? After the resurrection, if you remember Thomas, the Lord Jesus Christ is resurrected. He appears before them in the room. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Thomas got it. All right. All those connections are made more clear later after the resurrection. Here in John 14, they don't have this whole picture yet. The Lord is working with them to put it together. They need more understanding. But it's that lack of understanding that prompts the statement of Philip in verse eight. Look at verse eight. Philip said to him, he doesn't understand, he doesn't get it, and he's showing his ignorance here. Philip said to him, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. So now we've moved from the subject of Revelation, and we're talking about the sufficiency of Revelation. In verse 8, Philip raises a question about the sufficiency of the revelation that God has given to them in his son. Right? Now think about this for a moment, and be gentle with Philip. Apparently, the teaching, right, the miracles, Jesus walking on water, feeding 5,000 with little bread and loaves and fishes, giving sight to the blind, preaching with power, clearing the temple, raising Lazarus from the dead, all of that has been insufficient for Philip. And Philip says to Jesus, listen, show us the Father, and it'll be sufficient for us. He's asking for a visible display. Have you ever run anybody who's asked that question before? I was out on campus the most recent time that I've I've gotten that question. I had a college kid say, listen, if God were real, why don't he just show himself, and we'd all believe in him? Display the Father to us is what Philip is saying, and that will be enough for us to believe. That'll be enough for us to exercise faith. We've got to see him, Philip is saying. I need a vision. I need a vision. I don't think I can do this by faith alone. I need to see something. He's asking for a visible display, a visible presentation of the invisible God. Give us proof. Give us proof is what Philip is saying. Seeing is believing, right? That's his motto here. Now, as as the Lord responds to that, as you can imagine, in verse 9, there's a tone of exasperation. He says in verse 9, have I been with you so long, Philip, and yet you have not known me? I've instructed you. I've fed you. I've fellowshiped with you. I've encouraged you. I've strengthened you. I've given you a hope. And yet you have not known me? The Lord here reasserts the supremacy of the revelation that God has given in his son, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you ask for any other revelation? I am the supreme revelation of God. What does that tell us as we consider verses 7, 8, and 9? The subject of revelation, the sufficiency of that revelation, and the supremacy of that revelation. We must, you and I, you and I must as fully and as completely and as biblically as possible know the glorious subject of revelation. It's that knowledge of our 
object of faith. It's that knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ that provides the fuel and the content of our faith, which leads to verbing the noun. The more that you know Christ, the more that you know the word of God, the more in faith you'll be able to act and live and move and obey. Paul said, listen to Paul's response. Paul said, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of what? Knowing Christ. Knowing Christ. Knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. The revelation of God and the Lord Jesus Christ is graciously and lavishly sufficient. We don't need to go looking for signs and wonders, right? We don't need to go looking for other displays, special manifestations of God, visions and voices. You don't have to look for that stuff. God and God's glory is revealed in the person and work of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, remember Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter on the Mount said that they saw, he was an eyewitness to his majesty. They saw his glory. They heard the the audible voice of God. And Peter said, but we have the prophetic word which has been confirmed, which you do well to heed. We have the word. We have the word of God. Jesus Christ, the word, right? From John chapter one. Jesus was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He is the word of God, the revelation of God. Now, where do we see this revelation. He is the supreme revelation of God. Where do we see this revelation now, today? In your Bible. (laughs) You've got a Bible in your lap. This is the revelation of God to us. This is where we see and know Jesus Christ. This is where God is revealed, the Bible. I've never seen Jesus Christ with my eyes, and you haven't either, and neither have any of those charismatics that claim they have. None of them have seen the Lord Jesus Christ with their eyes, right? I've never heard his voice Never heard his audible voice. I haven't, like John says in 1 John, I've not handled him with my hands. I've not looked upon him with my eyes, right? But I believe, I believe with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength, all the time, that God is. And I believe that Christ is. I believe the Holy Spirit is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Why do I believe? Well, I believe because I have this book and this book is true. This book contains the evidence. This book contains the proof. This is the revelation of God. This is where we know Christ. It is sufficient. It is supreme. If you don't know your Bible, as many professing Christians don't, right? If you don't know your Bible, then you end up worshiping or putting your faith in or following some disfigured, corrupted, or perverted version of who Christ is. It's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. I've used this analogy before, but if you, if I was out somewhere and uh, someone came up to me and said, hey, uh, Mark, I met your wife last week. And I said, oh, really? You get a chance to meet Karen? Yes, yes, her name is Karen, that's right. She was, you know, I didn't realize how tall she was. So, you know, 5'11", and she's got a New Jersey accent. (laughs) That platinum blonde hair. I instantaneously, right, like you're you're talking about some other lady. That's not my wife. That's not my wife. The, The Jesus that most, and listen, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. The Jesus that most, a vast majority of professing evangelicalism, Catholicism and Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and everything else in between, the Jesus that most people conceive of is not the Jesus of the Bible. He is this wimpy, pathetic, compromising, reeking of hand soap wimp. It's not the biblical Jesus. The God, 
that most people conceive of is not the God of the Bible. It's, the, it's, a, it's a corrupted, disfigured God that they've been fed by false teaching. We must know the God of the Bible. We must know the Jesus Christ as he has been revealed to us on the pages of God's word. If you don't know your Bible, then you end up with a blasphemous and idolatrous version of God or Christ, and your faith is empty. Your faith is empty. Your faith, your faith increases and matures proportionately to your knowledge of God's word, of the Lord Jesus Christ as he's revealed in this book. As you understand Christ from the Bible, as you know God from the Bible, your faith will mature if you're in Christ, if you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then your faith will mature and progress proportionately to your understanding of Jesus Christ and God as revealed in Scripture. You know, I remember this story a while back about a guy, and the guy had a, he found this lump of rock, right? Beautiful. Like he thought it just, it looked beautiful, this lump of rock, right? Found this lump of rock, thought it was so beautiful, so cool that he took it home with him and he used it as a doorstop. He put it, I want to say it was the bathroom door. He put it in front of the bathroom door to keep the bathroom door from closing, this beautiful rock. Just thought it looked nice, right? Somebody had visited him and when they saw that lump of rock and they saw that it was being used as a doorstop, this person being a little shrewd and maybe a little deceptive, said, I'd like to buy that rock from you. And so he offered him what the man thought was some ridiculous sum. I don't remember what it was. Let's say $500. This ridiculous sum to buy that lump of rock in front of the bathroom door. So he bought the rock. He took the rock home. The man who had the rock was rejoicing, got all this money for this lump of rock that he was willing to part with. That lump of rock ended up being, at that time, the largest uncut diamond in existence. The man who bought it for a mere hundreds of dollars went away with this enormous treasure and the man who had it as a doorstop in front of the bathroom door was <laughs> oblivious. Now there are two grievous errors that you can fall into with respect to your faith. One one error is this, treating the knowledge of Christ like a doorstop. Like, a, you know, it's a nice thing. It, it looks nice. But you got it in front of the bathroom door. It's not the treasure hidden in the field that you would give all to purchase, to acquire. It's not the pearl of great price. It's just a doorstop in front of the bathroom door, right? There are many Christians who can fall into the trap of treating their faith like that. The other grievous error that you can fall into, the other grievous error that you can fall into is purchasing, right? It's purchasing, taking home to you this thing that you, you put in a beautiful, ornate glass case, you know, in front of black felt. And you've got a light shining on it. It's on a pedestal. You put a plaque above it. It's, it's the only thing on the wall. It's the focus of everything on that wall. It's just this thing that you have displayed. And come to find out, it's nothing more than a lump of coal. That's the way that others, they have this thing that they believe will take them to heaven, and it's not the real thing. It is a lump of coal. Both errors occur because you don't know the Christ of the Bible. So we don't know the word of God, right? We, we need the, the subject of our, the content of our faith informed that comes from the Bible. Point two on your notes. We've looked at the, now faith, let's look at the evidence for faith in verses 10 and 11. The evidence for faith, verses 10 and 11. In verses 10 and 11, the Lord gives us now evidence for faith in him. We see evidence in his words, we see evidence in his works, and we see evidence for his worth or his worthiness to be the object of our faith. Now, specifically, all three are precisely because of the Lord's special and intimate unity with God the Father, all right? Look first at the unity of God the Father uh, and God the Son with respect to his words in verse 10. 
his words in verse 10. He says there, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, and I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now, the question in verse 10, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? That question presupposes that they should believe, and why? They should believe because of the words that he's spoken to them, all right? We have God's word, we should believe. You have no excuse. We have God's revelation, you should believe. You have no excuse. Now, what specifically are they to believe? Now, certainly, verse 10, they're to believe the words that he speaks, right? They're to believe the words that he speaks. But also, they're to believe that Christ is perfectly and intimately and uniquely and completely in unity with the Father. You look at verse 1, John 14, verse 1. You believe God? The Lord Jesus Christ says, believe also in me. Believe also in me. Okay, he is to be the object of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. There's this perfect, complete unity of God the Son with God the Father. Now, notice in verse 10 that it's also the Father who dwells in me. He says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, that's an amazing statement. A profound statement. D.A. Carson said, no mere envoy, right? No mere man would refer to the one who sent him as his father. The Jews wanted to kill him for that because he made himself equal with God. And that no one would claim that whoever has seen him has seen the father. Can you imagine a man saying that? Well, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. (laughs) No. (laughs) And no, not one mere man would affirm mutual indwelling between himself and the father who sent him. So at the end of verse 10, this perfect unity, this perfect, complete unity with the father, Jesus says he does the works that he does. At the end of verse 10, who is it that Jesus says does those works that he does? It's the father. It's the father. There's a unity reflected in his words. There's also here a unity reflected in his works Now, the work where that is most gloriously displayed is the cross. You see the work of God the Father. You see the work of God the Son in perfect unity at the cross, securing and purchasing the salvation that he has from before the foundation of the world decided would come about. God most clearly reveals himself in the Son at the cross. Now, the disciples don't fully understand these things, but they will. When the Spirit comes, the Spirit's going to illumine their understanding. They're going to see more clearly that which they only see dimly at this point. So the Lord commands them in verse 11. This is a command. It's an imperative. Verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Verse 11, you see a unity in worth. A unity in worthiness. Believe me, Jesus says. Put your faith and trust in me. He's emphasizing his unity with the Father, but in emphasizing his unity with the Father, he's emphasizing his worthiness of our faith in him. It's this unity. If you think about the unity of the Lord Jesus Christ with God the Father, that unity ensures to us that Jesus Christ is properly and rightly and perfectly revealing God the Father to us. This unity with the Father demands our faith. Christ is no mere man. He is fully man and also fully God. And the Lord says, if you have trouble with what I'm saying here, at the very least, believe on the evidence of the works that I've done. I heard a quote this week that should make you think, right? It's a quote that should make you think. Quote goes like this. It's one thing to believe in God, right? It's one thing to believe in God. In God, it is quite another to believe God. Now think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. It's one thing to believe in God. It is quite another to believe God. I can believe in Abraham Lincoln, right? I believe in Abraham Lincoln, but my belief in Abraham Lincoln doesn't change my life. Doesn't transform my heart, right? If I believe God, that belief is going to govern my life. And the Lord Jesus Christ 
what God has done from eternity past for me in Christ, in the gospel, that will govern my very existence. In him, I live and move and have my being. When the Bible reveals God as perfectly holy, right, demanding holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. When the Bible reveals God as perfectly holy, and then you or I come across a passage like Ephesians 4, where God says this, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now listen for a moment. It's one thing to believe in God. It's another thing to believe God. When you believe God with saving faith and you come across any number of passages where you see a command, such as Ephesians 4, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. What do you do? That's a pivotal question. What do you do? If you have the faith of Moses, or if you have the faith of Abraham, if you have a genuine, authentic, saving faith, you believe God. You put your head in your hands, you weep over having offended God with that foul mouth and your dirty jokes, and you mourn over the fact that you have grieved the Spirit with your profanity. In other words, you repent you turn from your sin to serve the true and living God with a sanctified tongue in your mouth because he is worthy to be obeyed, worthy to be trusted, and he is commanding that kind of faith. Believe me. Do you see? Now he's saying, believe me, believe me, and as a fruit of that belief, you're going to act and walk and live in accord with that faith, with that belief. You know, the, the scholars, theologians, often talk about faith in three parts. I know we mentioned this before uh, here. One part, the initial part of genuine faith is what they call notitia, notitia. It's a knowledge of the facts, right? It's a knowledge of the facts, the content of our faith. It's the, the substance of what we believe in, right? We must know the object of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's notitia, notitia, a knowledge of the facts, the second part of genuine, living, thriving, healthy, saving faith is a census. A census. It's believing the evidence that's been given for our faith. One thing is to know it. The other part is to believe it, all right? It's the settled conviction that those facts that you know, it's the settled conviction that those facts are true. I not only know it, but I believe it, okay? Okay. You can know it and believe it. The third part of genuine saving faith is fiducia. Fiducia. Fiducia refers to commitment. It refers to trust. Listen to me, okay? Knowing and believing the content of our faith is not enough. Knowing and believing is not enough. Enough. Demons have that kind of faith. James 2.19, right? Demons know the truth and demons believe the truth. Faith is only savingly effectual if knowledge and conviction result in the conviction to obey him in all things. Commitment to obey, trust, trusting him for all he is and all he's done and trusting yourself to him in all your circumstances, in your life. Fiducia refers to commitment. So now we've discussed the necessity of knowing the object of our faith, believing the evidence for our faith. Let's look at point three, the evidence of faith. There's an important distinction there, evidence for faith but now the evidence of faith. If you look at verse 12, this refers to that idea of fiducia. Jesus has been appealing for and commanding faith. In these verses, he's emphasizing the fruits of faith, the fruits of faith. Look at verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he's gonna do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, verse 12, look first at the promise of works. The promise that, that the Lord makes of works. 
He begins, most assuredly, amen, amen. Truly, I say to you, listen, the one who actually has saving, biblical, God-given faith in me will do the works that I do. That is a strong statement. The Lord Jesus Christ did a lot, didn't he? They're going to do the works that I do. Now, that's followed by, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Now, that's an even stronger statement. Now, what is he talking about here? He's going to do greater works. Now, we can be very sure, we can be very sure that he's not talking about what most crazy charismatics want you to believe that he's talking about. The way that they would say that this verse goes is, see, look, we're going to do the works that the Lord Jesus Christ does. We're going to heal the sick. We're going to perform miracles. We're going to cast out demons. Now, you got to keep reading, keep reading. He says, and greater works than these he will do. Now, supposedly healing some guy of a hangnail is not greater than raising Lazarus from the dead, all right? Supposedly giving a guy 20-20 vision from 20-40 vision is not greater than giving sight to a man born blind, all right? Those are liars and snake oil salesmen. You notice these guys don't hang out in hospitals, right? Right? So now here's one thing we know. We know this for sure. He is not referring, when he says you're going to do greater works than these, he's not referring to more spectacular works. He's not referring to more supernatural works. There's nothing greater, nothing more spectacular, nothing more supernatural than raising Lazarus from the dead. It's not going to get greater than that. The Lord Jesus Christ in his own resurrection, his own ascension, Nothing is more spectacular or more supernatural. So it doesn't mean that, okay? Secondly, greater works here does not mean more works, right? Now, Jesus Christ was one person, and now through the church throughout the ages, they're going to perform so many more works that those works are considered greater because there's just a lot of them. There are far better ways of expressing that in the Greek if that's what he intended to say, all right? That's not what he's saying here. We have two clues to his meaning here. You're going to do the works that I do and even greater works than these things you're going, to, you're going to do because I go to my Father. The first clue to the meaning is that phrase at the end of verse 12, because I go to my Father. Jesus' disciples, Jesus' disciples will perform greater works because for the reason that he is going to the Father. It's not that they're going to have greater scope to do works because finally the Lord Jesus Christ is out of the way so we can get, you know, turns the turf over to us and we can do all these works. That's not what that means. The very basis, the very foundation, the ground of the greater works is his going to the Father. The works become greater precisely because of the new situation that comes about on his going to the Father. Now, what is that? What does it mean when he goes to the Father? What's going to happen when he goes to the Father? The Spirit of God comes. We're going to look at that next week. He sends the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes, all right? So the greatness, listen, the greatness of the work, the greatness of the work has everything to do with the work of the Holy Spirit, with the work of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me quickly to John chapter 5, a few pages back to the left, John chapter 5. Let me give you the second clue to his meaning here. First clue, because I go to the Father, the works, the greater works are going to be entirely Everything to do with the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 5, drop down to verse 16. In verse 16, John says this. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus, and they sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus answered them, verse 17, and said, My father's been working until now, and I have been working. Now, what... His father's been working till now. Working doing what? He's working through fulfilling his redemptive plan in history. The father is working on fulfilling his redemptive decrees, his redemptive plan in history. And the Lord Jesus Christ is doing the same thing. What did Jesus Christ come to do? Came to seek and to save that which is lost, right? So the father's been working until now, and I have been working. Look at verse 18. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, 
This is speaking of the unity with the Father again, right? The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. That you may marvel. Now, how does that happen? Look at verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. The greater works than these, the fact that the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Look at verse 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Here, the greater works that the Father will show the Son and that the Son will show his disciples are works of resurrection life and judgment. It's what's being spoken of here. Resurrection, life, salvation. Look at verse 24. Most assuredly, on the heels of this statement, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. And that is a great work. Right? That's a great work. Most assuredly, verse 25, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now think about it this way. The Lord Jesus Christ is God incarnate. He is a, a physical person constrained to a physical place, a physical location at a, a specific point in time, ministering to a specific and a physical group of people in Judea, how many were saved and in the upper room before Pentecost? 120. 120 disciples. 120 disciples. When the Spirit of God came at Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came, how many were saved at Pentecost? 3,000. That's a greater work. Do you see? This is salvific. This is life-giving work. Done, clue one, because I go to the Father, by the Spirit of God. Clue two, we see that here in John chapter five, beginning in verse 16. By his going, by the Lord Jesus Christ going to the Father, the Lord makes the Spirit's converting work possible. I'm gonna send the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God comes, there will be men and women from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation saved and converted 3,000 at Pentecost, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth. That's a greater work, isn't it? The greater works refer to the spread of the gospel. Now, who's going to, back in John 14, who's going to do those works? His disciples. And greater works than these you're going to do. Now, listen, Jesus says, verse 12, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, listen, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do. Reminds me of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Right? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, what if you don't have the power in your life that both compels you and empowers you to share the gospel with the lost? What if you don't have that power? You're not compelled. You don't do it. You're not empowered. It means you don't have the spirit. It means you don't have the spirit. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, when the Holy Spirit comes, the works that I do, you're gonna do also, and greater works than these. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be witnesses to me. But what if you're not witnesses to him? You don't have the Spirit. Having, being a witness is the fruit of having the Spirit, do you see? It may be because you're too ashamed. You're too ashamed. You're too fearful of man. You're just fearful. Fearful of what they might think. Fearful of the confrontation. Fearful of hostility. Too lazy. Too apathetic. Just don't have a heart for it. You're just not burdened. 
Right? Didn't Paul say that knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men? Maybe it means you just don't know the terror of the Lord. You don't know the terror of the Lord, so you don't persuade men. If you know the terror of the Lord, you're going to persuade men. They're on their way to hell. If this isn't true of you, then you're not his. Most assuredly, listen, amen, amen, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, he who has this kind of faith, he who has this saving faith, the works that I do, he will do also. I don't know how much clearer the Lord can make it. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses to me. Some do it, and they don't have the Spirit. You know, they do it in their own effort. You get the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they do it all the time. The Spirit isn't the basis and foundation of that work. But if you're in Christ, then you do it empowered by the Spirit. And the one who disobeys God in that grieves the Spirit. They need to repent of that sin and go out, choose like Moses, to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. The theological teaching of most churches today drives a wedge between faith and its fruits. They drive a wedge. They divorce faith from its fruits. Fruits of faith were purchased at the cross by Christ as faith was. Your sanctification purchased by Christ at the cross in the same way that your justification was. The issue here is determining the biblical marks of authentic, saving, true faith. Here, the Lord is concerned with the fruits of faith. In verse 12, the bedrock of those works is because I go to my Father. Look at verse 12. Because of the the coming of the Holy Spirit. It's not because you are greater that you're going to do greater works. No, it's not that. It's because he goes to his father, all right? And it says in verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. One foundation, one level of the bedrock of our works is the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. But another bedrock, another foundation of the works that we'll do is because he answers our prayers. He says in verse 13, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. It presupposes that the people of God pray. It also presupposes what the people of God pray for. They're praying in accord with God. When you pray in Jesus' name, you're praying in accord with all that he is, with all that he does, and with all that he intends to do. You're praying in accord with the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you pray, Lord, please, I need that Bentley to be able to share the gospel more effectively. <laughs> Lord, I, I, I feel called by God to be a missionary on cruise ships to Bermuda. Because those people need the Lord. If you're praying for some people in Bermuda need the Lord, yes, they do. People on cruise ships need the Lord, yes, they do. But when you pray with some self-indulgent or selfish motivation. You're not praying in Jesus' name. When we stand up and when we pray, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're saying that we are praying in accord with all that Jesus is, all that Jesus uh, does, all that Jesus intends to do. We're praying in accord with who he is as the object of our faith. And your selfish desires are not in accord with who he is. It's the bedrock of our works. And when he says, whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. It's asking in his name there that is critical. What are the source of that work? The source of those works? Who's going to do them in verse 13? Whatever you ask in my name, who does it? I will do, he says. Do you notice that? It's interesting. The mediatorial work of Christ didn't end at the cross. It continues. And his mediatorial work, leading men to God and revealing God to men, continues to this day through whom? His people, that's right. His people, right? Lastly, verse 13 and 14, the aim of this faith. Learned a lot about faith today. What is the aim of all? Verse 13, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And he does it to glorify the Father. He does it to, to the glory of God the Father, and it's done by his people to the glory of God the Son. The aim of faith is the glory of God. Now, 
in the splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ's exaltation, in the splendor of his exaltation, the son's purpose does not change. He enables his own to do greater things in order to bring glory to God the Father. Listen to this from 1 Peter. We're going through 1 Peter in small groups. Let's uh, look at this with application here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through what? Through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. You've been grieved by various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found with this aim, to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Faith is an awesome thing, isn't it? <laughs> faith authored by God and finished by God. Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Faith is the only means by which you or I can lay hold of the righteousness that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That righteousness is the ground. The Lord's righteousness is the ground of our right standing with God. It's imputed to us when we trust Christ alone to save us. The Father then, in that justification, declares us righteous in his sight and enables us to inherit eternal life. And it's entirely accomplished, accomplished entirely apart from any works that we do, anything that you can do. However, that faith, if it's real faith, will produce fruit, works. If you're here this morning and you're living in a pattern of sin and rebellion against God, if you've never been born again by the Spirit of God and given a new heart, then the Lord's primary concern for you this morning is that you would turn from your sin and put your faith in him. Cast off living any longer for yourself and trust Christ. Put your faith in him. If you're here this morning and you claim to be a Christian, then the Lord's concern for you from John 14 this morning is your faith in him. Is your faith in Christ a genuine, biblical, saving faith? Is it a healthy, thriving, persevering, enduring to the end to be saved kind of faith? We're not talking about mature faith versus immature faith. We're talking about saving faith versus non-saving faith. Do you see? There are elements which differentiate between the two. Many of us have not fully understood that when we first set out to follow Christ. Over time, you do. You know, many of us come to Christ, we're ready to storm hell with a squirt gun until we get our front teeth knocked out by some trial that comes along. We've got to learn. We've got to learn how to trust Christ. We get knocked down. We've got to learn how to get back up. You know, like Peter, right? I'll never be made to stumble. I'll never be made to stumble. I'm ready to go to prison and to death with you. And it's like, cock a doodle doo. You know, <laughs> we need to learn how to trust Christ, right? But that's the concern of the Lord here this morning. Trust him. Trust him. Follow him. Choose, like Moses, right, to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. You can do that now. You can do that now. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of Christ. Thank you for the person of Christ. Thank you for the work of Christ. Thank you for the content of our faith. Thank you, Lord, for the illumining and empowering and enabling work of your spirit. Thank you for the revelation that you've given us, God. Thank you for your grace and your mercy to us. Help us, Lord, to understand these things. Transform our hearts and minds by them. 
and strengthen us by your spirit to live wholeheartedly for you. As Paul said, you know, as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ, not entangling himself with the affairs of this life so that he may please him who enlisted him. Help us to live for you, for your glory, for your ultimate glory and exaltation. We pray these things. Amen.